In this video, we're going to introduce the harmonic oscillator wave function. So uh, like I mentioned in the last video, I want to take a different approach here. I don't want to uh, derive the wave function explicitly. Like I said, the, the mathematics details, it gets really dicey with the harmonic oscillator. So what I want to do instead is, is talk about qualitatively what we need this wave function to do and why the, the form of the wave function does what we need it to do. So, um, so for the harmonic oscillator, we looked at it, its potential was a, a parabola, a parabolic well, and that went to infinity at the edges of the well. So there's actually, as a result of that physical uh, form of the potential, there's actually only one boundary condition that we need for the harmonic oscillator wave function, and that is that the wave function at infinity, plus or minus infinity, must be equal to zero. So the wave function at plus or minus infinity must be equal to zero, right? Um, all, what does this mean for us physically? Physically, this means we can't infinitely stretch the oscillator, right? This just means that it, it, this has got to be zero at some point, right? Um, kind of sticking with the, the chemical bond analogy that we've been using. This means that if you were to, you know, the bond's got to break at some point, right? So uh, so this is what, um, what this boundary condition means physically, right? This is the only boundary condition that we really have to consider. So... What do we need this wave function to do physically with our problem? We need it to do, there's three things that we need to happen here. So let me use green here. So we need three things out of this wave function. There's three things we need. So the first is directly related to this boundary condition. So this wave function, whatever wave function we end up with, has to go to zero very, very quickly, right? It has to go to zero at those boundary conditions. So it has to rapidly go to zero, right, to satisfy boundary conditions. Right. So we need it to rapidly go to zero to satisfy the boundary conditions. Um, we also need it to decay rapidly for larger masses. Right. So we need it to decay rapidly for larger masses. And why is that? Why do we need it to decay rapidly for larger masses? Well, the reason is, and we looked at this in a previous video, as, as, the, um, as you start to have larger masses, larger spring constants, um, that's going to result in a narrower well. So it has to go to zero much quicker for larger spring constants, larger masses than it would for smaller masses and smaller spring constants, right? So we're gonna make, we have to make sure that this um, decays rapidly for larger masses. And I should put and spring constants too. I'll put and KF. So larger spring constants, larger masses, this has to decay very rapidly. Um, and so uh, the last thing that we need for, uh, for this function to do is that it needs to become larger as uh, the wave function grows, right? So it needs to become larger as the quantum number increases. So as the quantum number nu increases, psi must also increase. Right. And this is kind of a general um, thing of any wave function, but just putting it here as the, the last thing that we need here. Right. OK, so we've got so we've, we've got the three things that we need our wave function to do. So now I'm going to go through the general form of our wave function and kind of explain how each one of those pieces solves each of those issues. So let's so let's first kind of just draw out just a general skeleton of what this wave function is. And let me use a different color here. So our wave function will have the following three pieces, right? So first we'll have a normalization constant. So a normalization constant. Obviously that's something that you need for any wave function, right? It's got to be normalized consistent with the Born interpretation as we've as we've talked about for other quantum problems. 
Um, now, the other piece is going to have to be some polynomial in X. So you'll need some polynomial in X, right? The polynomial will help us to be able to solve problem. Uh, the second thing that we need to do, right? We need for a wave function that decays rapidly for larger masses. So we'll need something, some polynomial that tracks with the mass of our particle, right? So, uh, so this is going to be some polynomial in X. And the last piece is going to be a Gaussian function. So a Gaussian function. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Gaussian functions, um, if you spend any time, significant time in physical chemistry, you will get very well acquainted with Gaussian functions. Easily one of the most useful functions, period. I mean, you know, people in other fields may disagree with me, but Gaussian functions are super, super useful for physical chemists. And you, when you look at the shape of a Gaussian curve, so I've kind of sketched out what a Gaussian looks like. It looks like a parabola, somewhat, but, it actually rises and falls much, much sharper than a uh, than a parabola, a traditional parabola, like a regular X squared uh, parabola would. And so, you know, it, it becomes a very useful function because you can really create whatever you want on top of this, right? Uh, we talked about quantum superposition. You can get a, a superposition of a bunch of these galaxies and fit darn near anything really to to what you need um so a gaussian function is really useful and it's going to be useful for us for for uh purpose one here we need something that rapidly goes to zero the gaussian function decays faster than most right it gives you a good value and a good spread but it also decays very quickly so um so you know this is going to be um what we will need for this uh for this portion of our harmonic oscillator wave function okay so those are the general pieces now to the actual nuts and bolts of it right so this wave function will have the following form we'll have our normalization constant which will depend on the um quantum number nu so we got that piece there um we will have something called the hermit polynomial which is a very mathy <laughs> series of polynomials, uh, something that I will discuss in more detail in the next video. Uh, but this is called, these are called the Hermit polynomials and they're a function of a variable Y. Like I said, we'll introduce this in the next video. Um, and then at the end, we have a Gaussian function that is also gonna be a function of Y. Now, Y in this case is related to X. Y is going to be uh, X over alpha where alpha is h bar squared over m times kf to the one fourth power, right? Now, um, mostly don't get lost in these details right, right, right now just yet. Once I explain the Hermit polynomials more fully, it'll make more sense. These are going to be a series of polynomials called the Hermit polynomials. And this is going to be your Gaussian, right? So Gaussian uh, allows us to rapidly decay to zero and satisfy this boundary condition, check. Hermit polynomials allow us to have a function that depends on the size of our system, the uh, KF, if you will, here, the spring constant, check. Um, and as new increases, the wave function must increase. And that's actually going to be satisfied by both our normalization constant and our Hermit polynomial are going to help us um, satisfy that third criteria. Okay, cool. So, uh, so that gives us an introduction into the harmonic oscillator wave function. In the next video, we're going to actually talk more about these guys, the Hermit polynomials, um, introduce you to them and talk about how we uh, normalize the harmonic oscillator wave function.